welcome to this lesson about the features used in the classification uh, system. So last lesson we looked at what are the order uh, for the levels of classification. I'd just like to start by seeing if you can remember them. Can you remember them without any prompts at all? Or maybe this would help. See if you can repeat them back to me. What's the order going from the largest to the smallest? Pause the video and see if you're right. Okay, here we go. Here's the answers. So we go from domain to kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and then species. Now, when we're classifying species, the actual definition for species is a group of organisms that can freely interbreed to produce uh, fertile offspring. Now, that's sometimes difficult because uh, not all organisms breed sexually. So if you're talking about an asexually reproducing creature, like, a, like maybe an amoeba, um, it might be difficult to use that classification. And also, organisms living in different places of the world, are not, you're not going to be able to have that test to see if they would interbreed freely. So in practice, we really use um, the anatomy of organisms to classify them. I'm going to talk today a little bit about um, how our idea of classifying uh, life has changed and how we've arrived at this three domain system. Um, later, later lessons, we're going to talk about the relationships between all the different uh, life forms and, and how we can kind of map these relationships using something called phylogenetics. But today we're really fe featuring on the anatomy and the physical features of things that mean that we classify them in certain, certain ways. So just a reminder, classification is grouping things on the basis of shared features. Taxonomy is fe uh, focusing on the physical similarities whereas phylogeny is focusing on the evolutionary relationships between them. So, first we're going to look at um, something to do with, hang on a minute, how the history of classification has changed. So, way back in 1735, uh, Linnaeus was the guy who came up with this first idea of having two kingdoms, and he just said that it was like, you could either be a plant or an animal, and those are the living things. This um, idea evolved over time, uh, and in 1866, with the development um, of sort of more powerful microscopes, people started to be able to see, you know, tiny little cells crawling around in ponds and things like that. So they came up with this idea of plants, animals, and protista. With the development of even more powerful microscopes, then people started to be able to identify smaller things, bacteria, basically. Uh, and then there was this idea of dividing um, all living things into two different empires, those with a nucleus, the eukaryotes, and those without a nucleus, the prokaryotes. So eukaryote means true nucleus in Greek. Um, 1956, so relatively recent, uh, we sort of went back a little bit to the kind of four kingdom systems, uh, four kingdom system. Uh, this kind of continued to develop Fungi in 1966 were kind of put in their own uh, group to show that they were different from plants. They they don't have chlorophyll. They don't make their own food. 77, six kingdoms um, with the discovery of this RK bacteria, which is really a sort of very different uh, type of bacteria from, from new bacteria. Kind of goes beyond the scope available, but they, they are different. And now we're kind of at, at this three domain system. So we have the eukaryotes. And then we have the eubacteria and the RK bacteria, which is what we just looked at. So let's go back to that, uh, to that slideshow. Um, now that we've reviewed the history of classification. So what we're going to do now is we're going to look at the main features of all the five different groups. And we're going to start actually with the animals, OK, the animalia. So the animals, oh, and this is a good, good time to be making notes. You should definitely make note of these bullet points here, which are taken from your textbook. So the animals, well, first of all, they're eukaryotic. Um, so their cells look like this. This is a eukaryotic cell. Uh, and it has very, lots of membrane-bound organelles within it, which is, uh, and it also has a true, a true nucleus, which is the kind of test of whether it's a eukaryotic cell. Now, animals are multicellular, and they're heterotrophic. And that's a word that's going to come up again in A-level, uh, sorry, year 13, which means that they get their nutrition. We all animals get our nutrition from eating, um, other things where we break down large organic molecules and we get energy sort of uh, from, from their metabolism. And normally animals are able, able to move around. Now that's not always the case. Here's all the different animal um, phyla. Uh, and it ranges from things that are really kind of just on the cusp of being animals, really, uh, like sponges, which are eukaryotic cells and animal cells. They don't have chlorophyll, but they don't really move much. And they also don't have 
really any true tissues. They're just all the same cell, kind of in a, in a sponge shape. Uh, all the way up to what we are, which is chordates, uh, which is something with a backbone. So here we've got a picture of a cnidarian, or jellyfish, which is a, an animal. And here we have a picture of a, a shark. I think that's a great white shark there. Uh, or maybe it's a white tip. Uh, and that was, was an example of a chordate. And I picked that one because it doesn't actually have a full spiny backbone, like vertebra, like sort of bone with um, a lot of calcium in the cartilage. It has a cartilaginous skeleton, so it doesn't have a skeleton like you and me. It's more like um, the cartilage in your nose or your ears. So that's the animals. What else? Well, we've got plants as well. So plants are also eukaryotic. Uh, they're multicellular. Their cells are surrounded by a cellulose cell wall. Now, we talked about the word heterotrophic for animals. Now, plants aren't that. They are autotrophic. So auto means like yourself. So they, they make their own food. They autotrophically produce their own food molecules. So they absorb simple molecules like carbon dioxide and water. They combine them in, in photosynthesis to make larger organic molecules, which is the food source. And they all contain chlorophyll. Now, there's many different types of plants ranging from non-vascular plants uh, like this, uh, which are like mosses and things like that, all the way up to flowering plants. And, uh, the, most of the plants that we see are flowering plants. These are sort of pine um, type plants, conifers, and these are ferns. So here's a eukaryotic plant cell. Again, it has membrane-bound organelles and a true nucleus, but it has a little bit, a few different features, cellular cell wall uh, and chloroplasts being very important. So just to show you the range of things that are plants, here we have some moss, that's a plant. And then here we have the world's biggest tree uh, by volume, which is General Sherman, that's me down there. Um, and that is in Sequoia um, National Park in California. And I think it is about 100 meters tall and it is just absolutely enormous. Uh, right, so that's plants. Okay, fungi. So fungi, First of all, it's worth saying that they used to be kind of grouped in with plants, but it because they kind of grow through the soil. But there's key differences. First of all, they don't have they have a cell wall, but it's made of chitin and not cellulose. Um, and they they are eukaryotes, and, but they don't have chlorophyll, so they don't make their own food. So they are mainly um, heterotrophic, but they get their nutrients by causing the decay of organic matter. Let's, let's zoom in. So here are some of the phylums of fungi. You, know, you don't need to know any detail about this, um, but I just wanted to put in this little uh, animation here, this gif, of um, fungi growing. So you can see them sort of growing. I think that's out of a tree trunk, actually, and then kind of um, sort of producing this mushroom, which is how they reproduce. They, they release spores. Um, now this is a diagram of how the cytoplasm is multinucleate, so kind of the, the cells kind of fuse together, so you kind of have like a nucleus in this part, a nucleus in this part, and a nucleus in this part, and the cells kind of grow to form these things called hyphae, which are long thread-like structures, um, and when you have lots of hyphae, you have a mycelium, which is kind of like a network of hyphae growing out. And what they do is they release um, enzymes outside of the hyphae to digest the food and then they take back in the good stuff. So this is called saprotrophic nutrition or saprophytic nutrition sometimes. Uh, and one last thing about fungi, they are pretty awesome. This is actually the world's most fastly accelerating uh, organism and it is a tiny little fungus that grows on a uh, like a cow pat, like a cow poo basically, and it has its little uh, spores on the top of these little water water rockets and powered by osmosis these spores are launched and that will fire them uh, a couple meters to land onto the next cow pat and when it, when it accelerates like that I can't remember the exact figure look it up but it's something like a thousand G's which is just insanely fast accelerating so fungi okay prokaryotes these are what we know as bacteria I think you probably know this reasonably well um, now first of all there's quite a lot of bacteria uh, goes beyond the spectrum of uh, sort of the A-level kind of syllabus. But here are some of the different types of bacteria, all these different types here. Uh, only one maybe worth worth noting is cyanobacteria, a kind of bacteria that do photosynthesis. And we actually believe that these cyanobacteria um, kind of evolved into chloroplasts during something called an endosymbiosis event, which is when a, um, one of these bacteria was kind of swallowed by a larger cell, but then kept as kind of like a little... 
um, sort of, I don't know, kept as a sort of um, domesticated bacteria inside, becoming a, bac uh, becoming a chloroplast to produce um, food. Anyway, uh, the key features of a prokaryotic cell are here. They don't have a nucleus. So the DNA is all kind of coiled up, but it's not associated with histones. So it's kind of like naked uh, and it's a loop of DNA. Now, they don't have any membrane bound organelles, so they don't have mitochondria or, or things like that. Um, and also, if you look, if you were to look at really closely at the ribosomes here, they'd actually be smaller than in the eukaryotes. So they're 70 S ribosomes as opposed to the 80 S ribosomes in eukaryotes. Some of them are free living, uh, living all over the place. Some of them are parasitic or causing disease, but actually we're finding more and more that um, that we need uh, microorganisms, especially in our digestive tracts, to keep us healthy. Okay, so that leaves one remaining thing. Oh, one more picture there. Uh, so then there's a few more pictures of the kind of different shapes of bacteria, uh, prokaryotes that you can find. This one here uh, causes stomach ulcers. Uh, this is very common sort of commensals lives all over your body. These ones are mainly pathogenic here actually. Cholera bacteria there, salmonella. Um, that one produces botulinum toxin. That's a particularly nasty one. Okay, protozoa or protoctista. Now these are kind of the old ones out basically actually. I'm going to go back to this image here which you've seen a few times. Um, and basically if we don't know what it, where we should put it, we call it a protozoa. So we've looked in the eukaryotic zone uh, over there before, and if we don't put it in the animals, fungi, and plants, and it's a eukaryote, it's a protozoa. So they're um, eukaryotic non-animals, non-fungi, and non-plants, then it's a proto protoctista. So they're mainly single-celled, although some algae can be multicellular, and they have a really diverse array of uh, forms and features. Some of them are quite animal-like, some of them are quite plant-like. They mainly swim about and they have different forms of nutrition. So some are autotrophic, they make their own um, food by doing photosynthesis and some are heterotrophic, they eat. So here's an amoeba down here. This is a heterotrophic one crawling around and it will kind of take uh, take in things using these kind of, these kind of um, growing feet type things, they're called pseudopods. Um, and here is a paramecium. So this paramecium, interestingly, I think it has, can you spot them, two different contractile vacuoles. Remember that came up in the year 12 mock? Can you see them there? Um, kind of squeezing away. Uh, and also some, uh, there's another uh, protozoa that you might want to look up uh, called a euglena, which is very much like a paramecium, but it's, it's green. So it swims around um, from places of low light to swims off to the high light intensity so it can kind of maximize its photosynthesis. So it would be an autotroph. So that's the protozoa. So that's it. Those are the five kingdoms. Um, I hope you've understood that and taken some good notes. And what I'd like you to do now is just to review that using page 280 and 281 in your textbook, and then to answer these uh, six questions here uh, in your book. Um, so pause the video, we'll give you a few minutes to do that, and then we'll come back and you can see how you've done with the answers. Okay, ready for the answers? Here we go. So uh, if you could green pen your work, showing, you that, showing me that you've done the questions and you've uh, kind of had some feedback from, from the mark scheme here. Uh, and then if you are in my class, please send that um, screenshot uh, of your work completed to me on Microsoft Teams, please. Okay, thanks very much. That was the uh, lesson on features used in classification. Uh, and before we go, we'll just have a quick look at the syllabus to check we understand what we should. So can you do these things? Can you understand or describe the features used to classify the organisms into those five kingdoms uh, to include the use of similarities and features and differences? Uh, and can you also talk about the evidence that has led to the new classification systems, uh, such as the three domains of life, which clarifies uh, the relationships? Um, so we're going to be looking a little bit more uh, about this next lesson. We're going to be looking at the, the kind of genetic evidence um, uh, and how that's kind of decided or determined the way we classify things and how phylogenetics um, evidence has kind of contributed to that. Okay, so that's the next lesson. All right, thanks very much. Bye-bye.